Okay guys, welcome to another episode of DJ Arnesh's History Podcast. It's taking you through the airways of time, letting you experience history as it once was and as it is. Today we are going to be talking about ASEAN's regional security role in the first decade through the Vietnam War. So we are still uh, focused on two very specific things uh, in terms of the scope right now. Number one, we are still looking at ASEAN within the first 10 years, the first decade of its existence and what kind of role and function did it play and to some extent how effective uh, was it in dealing with the regional security situation. So the first scope right now is that we are still dealing with the first 10 years of ASEAN's existence. The second specific scope we are dealing with is ASEAN's security role. So ASEAN has other roles and functions which we'll talk about in due time but for now we are still looking at ASEAN's security role. Um, we've looked at the uh, Bangkok Declaration and clearly stated is uh, uh, regional cooperation, security, uh, securing regional peace and stability and things like that. But as we've all been through before, they are still very, they are couched in vague terms or broad terms and we want to explore the role uh, even further today uh, from 1967, the Bangkok Declaration, but we also want to see how it evolves over the 10 years. So today's crucial key term to keep at the forefront of your mind as we go through the lecture today, it's the term development. So we, we really want to track its progress. We are looking at the change and continuity of ASEAN's role uh, in managing regional issues, specifically the area of regional security. And since we are talking about regional security in the first decade, I thought I'd use the Vietnam War case study as one of the prime lenses in which we can see ASEAN's development and evolving role in the security landscape in uh, Southeast Asia. Now, uh, to entice you guys further, um, I'd like to do this in my podcast just to check if you are listening and you know if we are following through the entire thing from the first second all the way to the last second. Um, throughout the podcast, uh, or at least one point in the podcast later on as it goes on, I'm going to be announcing something secret. Uh, it's a clue to something and the first person who gets it and lets me know will get a prize during lecture or something like that. So stay tuned, watch and uh, listen to the whole podcast in its entirety. Uh, but of course, the biggest lesson here is not the prize but the wealth of knowledge that you get from listening 
to this podcast and the soothing of your soul as you listen to this monotonous voice. So, today as we look at ASEAN security role, we are going to be looking at a number of different things. Of course, seeing that we are using Vietnam War as our prime case study, we are going to be looking a bit at ASEAN's relationship with the Cold War. We are also going to be looking at the geopolitical shifts. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> okay, that's a NG, NG. Cut, cut, cut. Uh, we are also be going to look at the geopolitical shifts in the region, the development of the security landscape and the political landscape in the region and how that affects and influences ASEAN. Remember the Cold War and Vietnam War, they, in a sense, they are external events, they are global events, but they do have some effect and some influence uh, in how ASEAN develops, especially about its character, its functions, its roles. And uh, we want to be looking specifically at four of the most prominent documents that are emerging out of ASEAN in uh, the first decade. And so these are the four documents that I'll be referring to to track their development. These four documents are already on the Google Drive under this folder, so you can just go and uh, access it there in its full entirety as well. Because I'll be extracting out information from these four documents, but if you want it in, in its entirety, you can find it on the Google Drive. And finally, I want to look at how ASEAN Way principles play out in this first decade as well. Keep in mind the crucial question that we have is the ASEAN Way principles. Did it serve ASEAN well or did it handicap the organization? Let's do a content stock take for um, the time that we have covered currently, leading all the way to, to ASEAN's formation and beyond. Now, in 1945, the war ends in the Pacific. We have a uh, cool graphics over here, but what we do have is um, the two atomic bombs on Japan that ended the war. Also produce my favorite creature of all time, Godzilla. Now, when the war ends, uh, immediately what happens is that nations are starting to urge for their independence and they are, for some of them, they are going to be fighting for their independence. So the end of empire uh, has come and now is the dawn of independence of Southeast Asian nations. The three countries that you see over here, Philippines, Malaysia and Singapore, the three of them have rather peaceful, amicable, diplomatic decolonization processes. Some of them may have taken longer than others, no doubt, but what characterizes the process of their decolonization is pretty much uh, peace and uh, amicability. Now, why is this relevant to us? Because what I would propose is that these three nations, as they decolonized the way they did, it set their relationship with foreign powers or it set their relationship with the Western powers and their colonial masters. Now, this has an effect to their worldview as to how they view foreign influence, especially Western influence in the region. And this might come to affect uh, the way ASEAN is formed and ASEAN's functions and its principles later on. So the ASEAN story actually begins 20 years before its formation, right from the cusps of independence and all the way uh, leading to the actual formation and development itself. Conversely, uh, those three countries were, um, were had peaceful decolonization processes, but when it came to other countries like Vietnam, or Indonesia, um, you can see that they had a violent decolonization process. It was characterized by confrontation and it went on for quite a prolonged period of time. And the, once again, if you go back to the significance, we can see that their attitude towards Western powers and their former colonial powers had, is vastly different from the earlier set of case studies. Uh, especially the country in question here right now is Indonesia. And we do know that Indonesia as a country and Sukarno as a leader, they had very, very strong anti-Western views. And furthermore, they also had a fear of uh, Chinese encroachment in the region. So once again, you know, how does that affect the formation of ASEAN, the motivations, as well as how it develops 
what kind of character does the organization adopt. The point I want to make here is that there are different countries with different experiences, different relationships with the external environment coming together to form this organization. And so when it comes time to set things like principles or objectives or methods and approaches, there isn't a natural alignment of the five countries. Things have to be negotiated. There needs to be some level of compromise. And that's how ASEAN, uh, ha that's the kind of philosophy ASEAN had in the beginning. And uh, it would last them uh, all the way till today. So the, the context is really important as we try to understand this organization. Of course, between 1945 and 1965, another development appears, and that is China, China uh, turning to turning communist. And uh, this happens in 1949. Again, in the Cold War setting, this would have an effect on regional politics as well, because right at the doorstep of the region, now we have a communist giant in the form of the PRC. Now, beyond the, uh, the fight for independence, as countries... It became independent, another set of problems started to emerge with regards to security situations. Um, the, the emergence of... <coughs> excuse. Wow, ASMR. Y'all can like repeat that cough like 10 hours and I think you'll feel a sense of peace. In case you're wondering, I'm not ill. I just drank too much coffee today and the acid reflux is kicking in. So I'm okay. Now, going back to the next set of problems that emerge, we have the interstate tensions. Now, the interstate tensions, um, some of them are byproducts of uh, the decolonization process. Some of them are because of the personality of leaders and so on and so forth. Okay, does it, those are to do with the motivations and the nature of conflict. But for us, once again, it, it, it spells out that this region is rather unstable at this point in time. Uh, it is a particularly vulnerable period in the region's history and the tensions, the conflict is very real, is very immediate, it requires urgent attention and things like that. But the one that we really want to throw a bit more spotlight on today is the Vietnam War. And I know that you, you guys have gone through Vietnam in IH and I'm pretty sure you have timelines and all that kind of stuff already, but let me tease out some of the highlights of the Vietnam War that is relevant to our study today. Now, in 1954, the first Indochina War ends. This is when the French decolonized Vietnam at Geneva. And this is a legal kind of arrangement and setting and all that. And what happens is that at that point in time, Vietnam gets independence. However, it is split at the 17th parallel. That means to say that while there is a split between the North and the South, both the North and the South are technically independent entities. So, uh, this is the situation in 1954. There were supposed to be elections for reunification for the entire country, but long story short, that didn't happen. And the 17th parallel remained, and there was a division between the North and the South. We fast forward about 10 years later, and 10 years later, with uh, some incidents that happened and with the escalation of the conflict and with the communists gaining ground in, in the north and so on and so forth, um, it, it, it got to a, an even higher level of point, which is the entry of the superpowers into this war in active conflict. So with the Americans, cool graphics over there, with the Americans, what the incident, what was the incident that triggered uh, the movement of uh, American troops into Vietnam is the Gulf of Tonkin incident in 1964. Thereafter, American ground troops, the American GIs, they made their way into Vietnam and started fighting the protracted war that we know of as the Vietnam War. The Soviets, on the other hand, they are looking at the situation as well. And of course, in a zero-sum game situation in the era of bipolarity, they are not going to give ground and they can't afford to give ground as well. So they also send support to the North Vietnamese, not in the form of Soviet troops, but in the form of resources, in the form of financial assistance, in the form of diplomatic uh, support, and so on. So this 
takes the war up to a whole different level because now we have superpower backing uh, behind the two um, forces in the north and the south. Now, this transforms this what would have been a civil war into a cold war battle and arguably it's you know within proxy powers and all that kind of stuff. So at this point in time, 1964, it is still three years before ASEAN is formed. So ASEAN has you know, no relevance at this point in time because you know, they are not there yet. But I want you to see the kind of geopolitical context, the Cold War context in which ASEAN makes its entry into the region. So this kind of later characterizes the next 10 years, the Vietnam War, as a uh, long story short, as, as things develop across the next 10 years, the, um, the, the communist forces, together with the allies in the south, they slowly but surely make their way uh, down all the way to Saigon uh, in 1975, thus uh, formally concluding the Vietnam War and also ushering uh, the reunification of Vietnam under a communist banner. So long story short, this is the Vietnam War and its trajectory. And today, I want to kind of try to um, situate ASEAN's development in terms of its security role in tandem with what was happening in the Vietnam War. So this is something that, you can see this timeline here, it's something that you could try to do in order to draw some causation or in order to draw some level of change and continuity as you study a topic. Now on the Bottom of the timeline, you can see the developments of the Vietnam War. So how, it, how its trajectory is like from 1965 all the way to 1975. And then on the top, you can see my four ASEAN documents, starting with Bangkok, going on to Zot Phan, and then finally with the Concord and the TAC uh, at the various points in time. Now, as I put all these... Um, highlights onto the timeline, I want to also see if there are certain milestones, certain significant points that uh, I feel are really important to account for the developing trends in ASEAN. So I can put a star over there, for instance, you can see three stars over there, and you can see that these stars would kind of help to explain why there was the emergence of Zotfan, and then later on, why was the emergence of the documents of Concord and the TAC. So this is something that is quite simple to do, um, and, but the, the, the impact factor is quite, is quite large because you can draw a lot of relationships, a lot of causal relationships uh, between what you see in Vietnam and then later on uh, what emerges out of ASEAN. So uh, even, and, and beyond content and all that, we, we can also see that uh, ASEAN, as they, as they assess what's developing in the region, actually ASEAN, at this point in time, you may call them reactive. Uh, they are at the, I wouldn't say mercy, but they are kind of reacting to the regional developments at that point in time. But at the same time, we can see that ASEAN is reacting. Now, the reaction in itself from a, from a very infantile organization at that point in time, I think, given the context, given the very young age of ASEAN, might be also credited. But let's go further into these uh, documents in order to assess what kind of things did they enunciate pertaining to their security function and all that. Now, keep in mind, as I talk about security, I am not saying, and this is something to really keep in mind, uh, ASEAN is never and was never meant to be a security organization in the form of a military or defense kind of organization. Uh, nothing like NATO and all that kind of stuff. So they're they are never meant to be something like that and they, they to this date, you know, they, they never are. But uh, that being said, they can have a security purview over the, over the region couched in terms of regional peace regional stability. So that is the goal over here, regional cooperation for regional peace and stability. They are not an enforcing mechanism. They do not have any legal, jurisdictional, arbitrational kind of power that some of the international organizations have. 
Um, so their effort is really in facilitating regional cooperation for regional peace and stability. So it's couched in those kind of terms. And as I go into the documents, that's something for you to keep in mind. Okay. Okay, now the first one, it's about the Bangkok Declaration, 1967. By now, you should have seen this in some form or another. Um, and by now, we should, we should understand the politics behind uh, the wording, the sequencing, the presentation of the Bangkok Declaration. Uh, as I said, usually diplomatic pronouncements like this, uh, a declaration, they would have some politics behind it. We can see that as um, in, in terms of the, the document itself, the, the, the manner, the mode of presentation and the way they sell ASEAN is, is very much couched in non-security or non-political terms. In fact, the, the, the main thing that is being highlighted is you know, economic, social functions, cooperation in some broad, <coughs> broad sense and things like that. Uh, but let's take a look at the points in in the document where it does concern some manner of uh, peace and stability. So you can see these are one to five quotes that I extracted out from the document itself uh, in, in order to, to, to point towards the, the points about peace and stability. And I think just summing it up or, or looking at it right now, we can see that they are couched in very broad terms. It is uh, pretty, if you want to use the word vague, and all that is is also possible to to say that, and we can understand the context behind that because at that point in time, the five nations, as I went through in a previous lecture, they had many disagreements, but they wanted to push the organization through, and so with that political will behind, uh, pushing through the organization, they they. They had to compromise a bit, they had to keep things broad and vague and so on. And so this is the, the document that emerged that could allow for ASEAN to be passed through into existence. One of the more controversial ones you can see, uh, point four, all foreign bases are temporary. Remember I went through that whole bit about how there's a, a huge issue and a huge question mark over the, 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 the manner of external interference, the issue of external interference. Um, and that has uh, all sorts of Cold War implications as well. So I think the idea here is that in 1967, when ASEAN enunciated a security role, or when ASEAN enunciated their role in managing peace and stability in the region, it was kept broad, it was vague, there was nothing too specific about what this organisation would offer in terms of this specific role. Now, before I go on to Zopfan, which is about four years later from uh, ASEAN, uh, the Bangkok Declaration, what I would tell you now is the secret. Underneath one of the green tables, outside LT2 and LT3, I will paste a note underneath one of the tables. If you can find it, if you can read the instructions, and if you can accomplish it, then I will award you with a prize. Um, I guess I shall set a deadline. Latest, latest uh, entry for consideration of the prize, uh, I'll just set it as the 25th of Feb. That's a Tuesday, 12pm. So if you listen to this podcast before then and you decide to play this scavenger hunt a bit, uh, then I wish you all the best and <laughs> I hope that you'll have fun doing it and hopefully you'll get a prize as well. So, okay, that's my commercial break. Um, now going into Zotfan. Now the significance of Zotfan, let's talk about that a bit. The significance of the Bangkok Declaration quite clearly is that it enunciates the establishment of a regional organisation. Uh, it's unprecedented in terms of its uh, scale in terms of the political will behind this regional organization. That's, that's 1967. Now, what's the significance of Zotfan, 1971? Now, Zotfan is the first document, the first enunciation that spells out a security role for ASEAN. It, in, in, in the document itself, it's only two pages long, but it specifically talks about 
um, managing peace and stability in more specific terms than the Bangkok Declaration. Now, similarly, I have uh, extracted out different points in the document itself that talks about uh, peace and stability. But you can see that it's a, there is a greater dedication, there is greater coverage over what exactly is this organization going to do to manage peace and stability in the region. Keep in mind that at this point in time, the Vietnam War is still going on, there is still active fighting and so on and so forth. So again, trying to draw some sort of correlation or some sort of uh, relationship between ASEAN's development and the Vietnam War. And okay, there, there are other interstate conflicts going on as well. But trying to draw some sort of relationship there, we, we, we can see that uh, ASEAN increasingly saw the need to enunciate a role for themselves in terms of their security function. So it is very much conditioned by the context of the time, the immediacy, the urgency, and so on and so forth. Now, if we go back to the timeline that I showed you just now, 1971 is two years after 1969, hashtag quick math. But more importantly, why is this significant? Because in 1969, Nixon announced the Guam Doctrine. And it basically enunciated that there should be a Vietnamization of the war. Now, this doesn't equate to American withdrawal, not yet. But it does signal that the American foreign policy towards Vietnam is shifting. And it is shifting towards their withdrawal. It's a signal, it's an indication that the American pressure in Vietnam is getting a bit too overwhelming for them and they are now reconsidering their strategy in Vietnam. Now, when ASEAN hears this, or you know, this is, this is public knowledge, when, when ASEAN sees this, I think that, that it's, not, it's not an exaggeration to state that they would have uh, read the trends and they would have had that increased urgency in order to, to further refine their peace and stability goals and objectives as well as their security policy for the region. Um, many academics have looked at Zotfan, and Zotfan is, is still referenced all the way till today. So it is an important document because, it, again, it is the first time that ASEAN really enunciated in clear terms uh, what their, 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 their role and, and, and function of uh, guaranteeing re regional peace and security is. So you can see some quotations over here. But at the same time, I, I would caution that um, it's, it's not a, a full-blown security document. Um, it is actually, in fact, I think it's only two pages long compared to some of the later uh, documents that come out. But... Uh, yeah, so at, at the same time, while it, is, uh, it, it does focus a lot more on security, however, I think that there is, uh, there is uh, a reservation that I have. Um, the, the, the security functions are still kept pretty vague. We, we're not sure about the commitment levels of the countries at this point in time because uh, countries have divergent strategic views towards the external powers in the region, and so on and so forth. So the old divergences in terms of their outlook towards the foreign powers, they are still there. So Thailand and Philippines have their own way of viewing things. Singapore has their own way of viewing things. Indonesia has their own way of viewing things, and so on and so forth. So at the end of the day, it is a statement of principle, which I can agree with. Um, but at the same time, I would say that this is more of a long-term ideal or long-term aspiration, like what they want to work towards to, rather than something that is now already there or set in stone. So I think I would couch it more in those kind of terms when I talk about Zotfan. But I think the important thing to understand is that there is still a development that we can acknowledge and that we can credit because Zotfan um, is important in setting what we call behavioral norms. When states conduct their relationships with one another, it's best that they approach their issues with a common set of norms. And that would help facilitate the dialogue process and so on and so forth. With a touchy and sensitive issue like security, um, Zotfan kind of sets some of these norms and kind of sets some of these uh, uh, benchmarks in a sense. 
it is a slow process, the second point over here, but instead of slow, I, I think I'll prefer to you use the word gradual, uh, is a gradualist approach. And again, there are two sides to this story. Number one, you can criticize it, it's too slow, it's not responding fast enough, it is only reactive to the events that are happening. But at the same time, on the other hand, is it, is it the best um, approach to such a complex region and to such a complex development with regards to the Vietnam War and things like that? Um, so I think when you assess these kind of things, I'm not pushing you in any way, but when you assess these kind of things, it's important to keep in mind the context of the situation as well as ASEAN's mandate. What did they set up to do? How do they want to do it? And so on and so forth. Uh, and at the same time, ASEAN is comprehensive in its approach as well when dealing with a security situation. Uh, keep in mind, ASEAN is not a defensive or you know, a military kind of alliance. And the way they deal with security can be comprehensive in the sense that sometimes uh, the way to deal with a security problem could be in economics. In this context, keep in mind that we are dealing with the communists and so on and so forth, the, that fear of, of, of communism spreading across the region. Um, and economics is one of the key things to consider in order to serve as a wall against communists because communism thrives in poverty and misery and um, the way, to, the way to, to, to stem the communist tide could be to improve the economic situation in countries. So you remove that precondition in which communism really thrives in. So ASEAN is looking more towards these kind of approaches rather than straight on military or security kind of, kind of uh, approaches. Now, fast forward five years later. Now, five years later, 1976, quite clearly, I think this should be the most apparent, uh, the most apparent regional development by this point in time, is that the Vietnam War has ended. Now, this is one year after the Vietnam War ends and um, the ASEAN heads of states, they, they meet in, in Bali for, for this thing called the Bali Conference. And out of the Bali Conference comes two very important documents. One is the ASEAN Concord and the other one is the TAC. Now, you can see the words Concord and uh, Amnity. These are also these are, uh, terms to indicate positive cooperation. But at the same time, it still, uh, it still retains that loose association kind of character. Uh, so it's not really an enforcing kind of thing, but it's more of countries working together in concord and in harmony and in friendship. That kind of cooperation is what ASEAN uh, seeks to establish for the region. Now you can see that uh, just now in Zogfan, um, we can see that they are enunciating their security role a lot more dedicatedly. Now, in the ASEAN Concord and the TAC, we can see that the, the, the prominence of political and security concerns have shifted all the way to the top. Keep in mind that I said that when you look at a diplomatic document, it's very political, especially in this case, the way that things are sequenced. Usually, what is sequenced first is the higher priority kind of stuff. So here you can see A. A is political. You contrast this against Bangkok, the Bangkok Declaration. And uh, at the start was economic. But you can see now, you know, it's kind of like political at the forefront. Um, and we can see that many of the clauses in terms of their sequencing and prioritization, a lot more is enunciated and a lot more is, a lot more accord is given to their security role in guaranteeing peace and stability in the region. So that's something to see. We can see that all the terms, the preambulary clauses are all reacting uh, towards the new developments in the region. And uh, a lot of it is also couched in security terms. Now, I know that I used the word reacting quite a bit in this so far, but from this point on, 1976, especially with the release of Concord and the TAC, I, I get it that there's still an argument to say that ASEAN is reacting to regional developments, but I would push you guys to also consider that there's some level of agency and there's some level of leadership coming from ASEAN uh, by this point in time. So by the end of their first decade, there are some early visible signs that ASEAN is taking the lead, ASEAN is driving 
um, the management of regional issues, um, and in this case, security uh, related matters. And I know that is the more difficult argument to make, but it is something to consider. And, but whether or not you, 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 can, you, you want to take this stand or not, it is evident to see that ASEAN is clearly more, um, more enunciated and, and more visible, more explicit, more intentional in communicating that they want to have a greater security role in the region uh, in terms of facilitating cooperation for peace and stability. So the significance of ASEAN Concord and the TAC is, is pretty much a, a, a bolstering and a reinforcement of uh, ZOCFAN five years earlier, setting the behavioral norms and having some sort of uh, structure within ASEAN to centralize uh, the communication and to centralize the socialization of all these uh, behavioral norms. Um, at this point in time, remember in 1967, we said that there are a lot of strategic divergences based on national interests across the five founding members. But at this point in time, I would argue that there is a greater sense of consensus among the five members and what they see as best uh, and how they want to manage uh, the, 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 the peace and stability in the region. So I think there's, there's still national interest at play and so on and so forth, but I think that there is a movement in terms of the consensus among these five countries as to how uh, to manage this region. So the comprehensive approach, it, it still goes on. It, it is connected to, to economics, but at the same time, it is also connected to national level agenda. So the same principle, like what I told you about economics just now, it applies here as well, where the idea here is that if your nation is peaceful, if your nation is stable, if there's sound governance, if there's progress and development, it would also serve as a bulwark to the growth of communism. And so ASEAN can also you know, um, guarantee and, and secure these goals based on those kind of strategies and those kind of avenues. And uh, right now, because the the war has ended. Uh, there is a new communist giant in, in the form of Vietnam. They are reunified and so on and so forth. Now, what is the regional outlook looking like for ASEAN? Are they going to be antagonistic towards this new communist power? Even Laos and Cambodia at this point in time uh, have very unstable political situations and communists are making a lot of inroads there as well. But what is ASEAN's stance? Now, going back to the principles of ASEAN, remember that they are not an anti-communist organization. They may be non-communist, but they are not enunciated as an anti-communist organization. And furthermore, ASEAN's mandate is that they are a representative of the region. So all these countries are part of the region as well. And thirdly, ASEAN's, uh, the ASEAN Way principles, they are all about fostering dialogue, cooperation, amity, concord, and so on and so forth. So, based on all these things, you can now tell, or you can see where I'm going when I say that uh, ASEAN, ASEAN's attitude towards Vietnam and other powers of the sort would be one of uh, trying to engage them rather than trying to distance or to create some sort of confrontation with them. And in the long, long, long term future, uh, there is already some thought about the expansion of the organization. Of course, that doesn't come anywhere soon, but uh, there is this kind of attitude towards non-members, but those countries in the region as well. So, at the end of the day, uh, tying everything together, we look at the development of ASEAN in terms of their security role and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, we, we want to relook the ASEAN Way principles as well. And a lot of these ASEAN Way principles, they were there back then um, and they continued throughout all the way till today. Going back to the idea of that gradualist approach um, and that kind of accommodationist stance, the idea of consensus and consultation, all these things were present and could be seen 
in, in the way ASEAN managed regional stability in the first decade. Now, the open question now is, was this the best approach towards managing regional security uh, or should it be open to criticism and saying that it is ineffectual, that it's ineffective? Um, you, can, you can try that out now in, in terms of thinking about the first decade, but the same question would apply as we go down uh, the, the, the timeline all the way to the year 2000. Because the essential question is this, which is, did the ASEAN Way principles help ASEAN in um, managing uh, regional affairs from its inception all the way to the year 2000? Now I'm giving you a scope, it's just the first 10 years, but pretty soon we will have to make overall assessments of uh, this, this entire timeline. But you can try it out, do a mental a thought exercise right now so that it can help you get there in small incremental steps. The gradualist approach, uh, we should adopt it just like what ASEAN did. Let's be inspired by the organization we all love. This is definitely not me urging you to write glory stories about ASEAN and about promoting them and things like this. Clearly not. But I do urge you to consider uh, the context as you make your assessments of ASEAN as an organization and the ASEAN Way principles as their uh, organizational philosophy. So that's it for today's podcast. Uh, I hope that this has been useful and I'll see you next time round. Thank you guys. DJ Anesh signing out.